why we need a national violence prevention hotline. So to properly introduce the idea, I'm actually gonna start with a three minute video. And right off the bat, I do have a trigger warning. No one is killed in this video. Nobody dies in the news story, but it is a news story that is pretty jarring and does have a 911 recording session. So it's about three and a half minutes. If you want to take a break, you will still get the point of the presentation without watching it. Anyone want to leave? You can go for it. Okay. So this is what inspired it, and I want to just share this with you. This is one of those nights when an ordinary American teaches all of us lessons about courage and the kind of resolve that can save lives. She's that school clerk who convinced a 20-year-old man to put down his gun at the elementary school in Atlanta filled with so many tiny school children. Last night, right here on World News, she first told her amazing story, but now ABC's Steve Osinsami has the 911 tapes that prove she was even more amazing than we thought. It's a heart-stopping call to police. You can hear the sound of gunfire. I'm in the front office. Oh, he just went outside and started shooting. Okay. He said to tell them to back off. He doesn't want the kids. He wants the police. So back off. And, um, and what else, sir? He said he don't care if he dies. He don't have nothing to live for. And he said he's not mentally stable. Antoinette Tuff, that bookkeeper the accused gunman confronted in the school office, stayed on the phone with police after the bullets started flying. It was scary because I knew that at that moment, he was ready to take my life along with his. And if I didn't say the right thing, that we all would be dead. She followed his orders. Then she tried to get inside his head. Do you, you want me to try? I can help you. You want me to try? You want me to, you want to talk to them? Want me to talk to them and try to... Okay, well, let me talk to them and let, let's see if we can work it out so that you don't have to go away with them for a long time. She told him her story. You're going to be okay. I thought the same thing. You know, I tried to commit suicide last year after my husband left me. But look at me now. I'm still working and everything is okay. She promised to risk her own life to help him surrender safely. And that's when he got on the ground and put the guns aside. It's going to be all right, sweet. I just want you to know that I love you, though, okay? And I'm proud of you. That's a good thing that you've just given up, and don't worry about it. We all go through something in life. This is where she buzzes the police in. <laughs> and this is where she breaks down. I ain't never been so scared all the days of my life. Need. But you did great. Oh, Jesus. You did great. Oh, God. Today, police told us that 20-year-old Michael Brandon Hill was carrying an AK-47 that he took from a friend's home. His family explains he has a history of psychiatric issues, and police say he told them he was off his meds. She's an everyday person who did something extraordinary, makes you recognize how school workers can so easily set aside their own issues to deal with everyone else's. Diane? Oh, she did teach us so much. Thank you, Steve. And by the way, Antoinette told me last night that her pastor showed her how to stay calm and pray on the inside in the midst of chaos. And so she did. So Antoinette Tuff, just a lady working in the office in a school in Georgia, was able to stop a gunman with loaded guns, an AK-47, just with the story. Now, I know that's not how the typical school shooting story ends, but that is what inspired um, my idea for a national violence prevention hotline. She used empathy and a human connection. So why am I talking about this? Because every single life matters, and currently, I think as a culture, we are failing to catch people before they go from fantasies and sort of ideas of how they want to let their pain out. And it's too late. We're hearing it in the news all the time. So don't have to raise your hand, but has anyone in this room been a victim of violence? Just in your mind. And do you know anyone who has been a victim of violence? I think almost anyone, everyone in this room at least knows somebody who's been impacted by violence in some way. And so that's why I started this idea. So I started thinking after I watched Antoinette Tuff, I started thinking, what if as a society we did things a little bit differently? Uh, you know, what if we addressed would-be perpetrators differently? And I'll get into that. 
What if we attempted to humanize those that would be violent? What if we stopped using violence as a first resort to somebody and as a, instead using a last resort to stop violence? What if we attempted to reach these people in some way who are contemplating violence and try to humanize them? Because after they commit the act, it's really easy to dehumanize them and call them a monster, call them evil and all that. And then we just put them in jail or they're dead. So how do we reach people, though, that might not engage in services? They may not seek help. They may be isolated using substance abuse, using drugs. So I thought, what if there was a hotline? Something anybody could use from anywhere at any time if they had a phone or if they had an internet connection. Oh, whoops, okay. So here's a quote uh, from Eddie Cantor, and he said, when I see the 10 most wanted lists for people accused of crimes, I have always thought, if we'd made them feel wanted earlier, they wouldn't be wanted now. So if we'd made them feel wanted earlier, they would not be wanted now. And that's a play on words, but we understand that, for instance, that kid who went into the Georgia school was actually an adult, not a kid. He said, I have nothing to live for. He was upset. Something in his life had gone terribly wrong, and then he got some idea. I know, I'm so angry. Maybe these kids are the reason, or maybe the school, or just maybe I'll be in the news. Whatever it was, he got, in his idea, he got an idea in his head and almost went through with a terribly violent act. So there's a lot of reasons, there's a lot of research behind why people commit violent acts, but I think as a society, it's just so easy to just point the finger and say, we don't have a problem with violence, it's just some crazy people sometimes get carried away. So the National Violence Prevention Hotline, which I'm gonna go over in detail, is trying to write a new story, It's trying to give a solution because clearly we have a problem with violence and our, even though community programs and local counseling can be very successful, it doesn't reach everybody. So after I heard about this story, I thought about a hotline. And I realized after reading a lot of articles that we have hotlines in the United States that are quite successful. We have the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. We also have the National Domestic Violence Hotline, Prevention Hotline. Uh, but we have no hotline really dedicated to anyone I mean, there's some hotlines to stop people turning in guns or gangbusters hotlines, but nobody really targeting violence more broadly. So just for people going for continuing education, uh, these are our learning objectives I'm going to go through. So what is the National Violence Prevention Hotline? You probably got a hint so far about what it is. It would be a hotline very similar to the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 24-7 access. Uh, master's level counselors manning the phones for people that are feeling compelled to act violently. Um, first of all, we want to provide de-escalation for the people in crisis. We want to do what we can, just like the suicide hotline, try to figure out what the situation is. We want to try to educate the person a little bit. I'll get into that. And we want to provide, eventually, get a hold of the person to get into local services, wherever they might need them. Um, also, if a situation is emergent and the person is not calming down, um, we may need to involve public safety or crisis for somebody who might need a hospitalization, which I think would be a much greater alternative than somebody committing a violent act. And then lastly, I thought as a, since we're, if we were making a hotline for violence, it could be a lifeline for people that don't fit into the category of domestic violence, but are victims of violence and don't know where to turn to, to get education. So that would be the other uh, use of the line. So I do think this line would fill in a gap. In 1958, we had one of the first local crisis lines was in Los Angeles, and it was to prevent suicide. Um, and it was created by a public health center in Los Angeles. And then around the rest, from the remaining years from now till then, there's been a lot of other crisis lines that sprung up, warm lines, psychiatric lines, um, suicide prevention lines regionally. And then uh, eventually, well, it took a long time. In the, in the midst of that, there was a big push to stop domestic violence. And so in 1996, the Domestic Violence Prevention Hotline was initiated. 
And then in 2005, of course, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline finally launched, which a lot of us are very accustomed to utilizing that. If any of you are clinicians, you probably have given that line, that number out. But that's not that recent, only about 14 years in existence. This hotline is not in existence. This is just an idea that I'm trying to promote and to get education out about. So let's talk about the cost of interpersonal violence. So every single day there's 43 homicides and over 4,800 non-fatal assaults in the United States. So by 1 p.m. today there were already 23 deaths as a result of violence between people. So I think this is a, this is a crisis that's sort of under the river. I mean, you hear about it in the news for a couple weeks, everybody gets really upset, then we don't hear about it. Then there's another incident, the people get upset, then we don't hear about it. Um, annually in the United States there's 16,000 homicides and 1.6 million um, non-fatal assaults requiring emergency room treatment. Um, in addition, some more statistics, there's about 12 million adults who report experiencing some type of violence and 10 million children experience some type of violence. That equals 23.6 million people in the United States experiencing some form of violence. And as you know, violence is underreported. So these are just things that are, are reported. I was trying to find the statistic on this and from the Bureau of uh, Justice Statistics, but they were saying something like, uh, it was somewhere between 30 and 40% of a lot of violent, non-fatal violence was not reported. So just imagine what the numbers were if we really had the numbers. Um, so in Chicago, we have 2.7 million people. That means the number of people in the US experiencing violence each year is 8.7 times the city's population and um, over half the city's population requiring, in the United States, requiring emergency room treatment for assaults. So now those were about actual physical violence statistics, okay? But I also wanted to talk a little bit more about interpersonal violence, which is a more broad definition. Uh, it can include also psychological violence towards a person or a group, and it could actually result in injury or death being physical, or psychological harm, maldevelopment, or deprivation. So I'm going to start going a little bit more broadly. Most of the violence I'm talking about is specifically physical, but I think there are broader effects, so that's why I brought up that definition. Um, as you know, if, if any of you have worked in clinics where people have been victims of violence, you already know what I'm about to tell you. It can cause long-term trauma and, long and short-term trauma, both physically and psychologically. Um, if anyone's familiar with the adverse child experiences studies, we've seen that expo just exposure to violence, let alone violence itself, can cause mental health conditions later on in adulthood. Uh, physical injuries, obviously, if you're being assaulted, you might have a physical injury that you might have to get physical therapy for, you may have scarring, other issues like that. This is from an article which will be referenced all, I have something like 20 references, you can read the articles later, but this is, they were saying also in the article that it stunts economic development as a country, it increases, inequality, violence increases inequality in the areas where um, violent acts are occurring more frequently, more inequality in our communities. Uh, it erodes human capital, people are not able to meet their potential that they want to do if they are victims of violence or exposed to violence often. Um, obviously, vicarious trauma, people whose family members have been expo exposed to violence or even just first responders uh, responding to violent acts and people working in hospitals. Um, obviously, there's increased personal and societal economics costs. And if any of you have taken a class um, here, I don't know if some of you went to the Chicago school or in your psychology school, there's now these research coming out about intergenerational trauma. And so obviously, that's something we've been seeing show up in genetic studies as well. So in uh, the United States, for instance, the homicide rate actually peaked in 1980 and it plateaued in about 2000, but it has not gone down. So it's been pretty consistent every year since 2000. And um, there's so many statistics, I'm gonna reference multiple studies, but one, st one place said 25 billion a year is what it's costing, but there's even bigger numbers. Um, if you weren't familiar, the homicide rate in the United States is seven times higher than other high-income countries that we could equate equal. So we've got a violence problem here. The World Health Organization estimates the cost of interpersonal violence, so physical and otherwise, is 300 billion a year. And actually, just economically to the victims, lost wages, healthcare costs, 
all of that is about $500 billion a year. If you add both those up, it's about 10% of the gross domestic product of the United States. So a lot of damage is being done. So in the other study I was reading was showing that California had the most cost with $22 billion a year, and Vermont is the lowest with $188 million. Um, this is for your continuing ed piece. And um, now here's another one. In, in another study I was reading, uh, the containment costs of violence, so police, emergency, courts, probation, prison, et cetera, is costing annually the United States about $1.7 trillion. I'm pretty sure that number's going up. Um, from what I was reading, they were saying the tax allocation is something about 460 billion. So if you estimate that by the population, that means anyone who files taxes, about $3,257 of your taxes are going to the containment costs and specifically violence containment costs, which I think, I, I brought in numbers of money, not that this is about money, but money, it gets people to listen in government. And so that's why these numbers are in here. Uh, and also just to show the impact of what's going on. So this is from another study. This is not even from the adverse child experiences, but a different one. If you're exposed to violence as a child, so not if you're, if a violence is committed to you or if you just witness it, whether it's non-lethal or lethal, 54% increased risk of depressive disorders as a adult, 78% increased risk of, of tr contracting a sexually transmitted disease and other behaviors and of course 32% risk of increased obesity. So there's physical consequences that go beyond the psychological and physical trauma that occur when a violent act begins. So I believe the National Violence Prevention Hotline could curb some of the costs we're paying. So I don't know how many of you, you can actually raise your hand for this one. If, you, if you've seen a news story after a mass shooting or somebody killed somebody and you, they interview the neighbor, this is classic, and the neighbor goes, well, he was just a regular guy. And I'm using guy because let's, be, let's face it, I don't have those stats, but it's mostly men. Um, so, oh, he's just a regular guy. We used to get bagels together. And then all of a sudden he shot up a school or shot up his office. And, and, and then all, I don't know, all my friends are like rolling their eyes like, oh, regular guy, my ass. You know, this is not a regular guy. This is evil. This is an evil person. So, and I was thinking about that. And I thought about the fact that, well, I don't know when he was last a regular guy, but at some point in his life, he was a regular guy. And so what happened to him that turned him from regular Joe at the bagel shop to the guy in the news story? What, what, what went wrong? So many things could go wrong. There's so many case studies we could do on this. But I guess what I'm trying to say here is this is at least a last possible net. If somebody's moving towards that direction, if they were thinking, okay, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to go out and hurt people because I'm angry. They could call a hotline. So I believe that could curb the cost. Obviously, the hotline is hopefully going to have a bigger impact than just being a hotline for violence, which I'll get into. But if we reduce violence, we reduce the costs on everybody. Interpersonal costs, um, the loss to our society with so many lives, and also economically. I believe that starting a national violence prevention hotline could start a national dialogue. There's the word national in there. And having a conversation that's a little bit deeper than just a bumper sticker news argument over should we ban guns or not. Um, I think we need to be having deeper conversations about violence in our society than that. Not that that's not a valid issue, it's just that it gets stuck in the news media and it sounds like a cycle and then everybody starts name calling. Um, I also would hope that we could start a cultural attitude shift towards looking for the warning signs of somebody who may be violent and trying to re outreach them instead of excluding them, trying to get them impacted into treatment. And hopefully more prevention programs. Obviously prevention programs are awesome. If you can get somebody into a prevention program in their local community, that's gonna be the best bet. But right now, I think, uh, I was reading about this and I couldn't find real stats, but there's clearly a lack of prevention programs in a lot of major cities and in rural areas for sure. So why am I saying all this about the, why a hotline? Why do we need that? I was looking at the success of other prevention hotlines that people, people were not saying would work when they first started. So, and now there's money involved from the government. In 2017, the National Institute of Health was earmarking 68 million for suicide prevention. But as you'll see in the ahead, 
Congress did not declare suicide a national issue until about 1996. So we live in a culture of denial, and that, that was leading to that. Um, so I'm saying, should we be focusing on the cleanup? Okay, we need police in schools. I have an idea. Let's pass a bill in Florida to have teachers armed with guns. Uh, I don't know. I've heard this. Um, if, you're, if you're a single person living in a city, you should have a gun and a knife. And you should be careful, and you should have that concealed carry permit. This is stuff I'm hearing in my office. This is stuff I'm hearing in the news. So why aren't we focusing on prevention? Why aren't we focusing on strategies that could prevent the fact of everyone needing to be armed in this country? Or saying they have to be. I, and that's where funding matters. So that's the national idea here. How do we reach people? Uh, so for instance, let's say somebody's depressed, angry, having a hard time. They might just say, I can't afford health care. Or I don't know how to get on Medicaid. I don't know where to find a counselor. So there's that. Um, they could have a lack of prevention programs or even quality services where they live. Uh, they could have shame of having violent thoughts. There's a stigma around that. There could be fear of being caught just by admitting, I've had fantasies of hurting people. There's fear involved. But a hotline is free. It can be called from anywhere at any time. That's why a hotline. Does prevention work? That's a big question. I don't know if we can answer that. I would say yes, from what I've seen, if you can get people involved in it. How does a hotline make a difference? It's always there. It's something that you can learn from. It's got multifaceted uses. So people call hotlines. And here's the two hotlines. So the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, again, I said it launched in 2005. It had about 46,000 calls, and it's growing every year. So in 2016, it had over 2 million calls. It's obviously getting popular. There's even a rap song. I can't remember who wrote it. With the rap song chorus is the person speaking out the National, Violence Pre or National Suicide Prevention Lifeline number. Um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline is a 24-7 hotline. If you aren't familiar with it, it was created for the victims of domestic violence. It gets now about 24,000 calls a month, growing every year. Uh, last year, 265,000 calls and about 3 million um, from 96 when it, to 2013. So I started thinking more about that when I read an article, which is referenced here, that one of the people that runs the hotline said that perpetrators of domestic violence have actually started calling sometimes this hotline that's for victims, saying, I don't know what to do. I just get so angry. Will somebody help me? Um, you know, my partner left me. I'm, very, I'm just very distraught. And every time they come back, we argue. And just talking to the hotline, and the hotline people were kind of surprised by that. But then the news article doesn't really go any further other than to say randomly perpetrators sometimes call. So I thought this hotline is a hotline for people that are suffering from violence, but also potential perpetrators. Um, we don't have, I, I just couldn't find anything like that. And I spent hours and hours and hours researching this and I, I couldn't find hardly anything, especially not anything just targeting violence in particular. So this would be the first hotline for this purpose. And in, in, the, in the overall culture, I think the use would be destigmatizing thoughts about violence, um, knowing that's a human thing, public awareness about the fact that that, that is a choice that people do make to, do, to uh, commit violent acts, education about what to do about that, and having an attitude shift. So this is a theory. I do think there's a cultural stigma about having violent thoughts and reporting them. So, people live in Chicago here, and the traffic is really easy to deal with, right? Okay, so how many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you have either experienced a road rage incident or thought about starting a road rage incident? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, and I've lived here as well. Um, we'll get to that, but essentially, <laughs> I'm, I don't want to ask what happened in your road rage incident, but Usually my road rage, inc ra road rage incidents are like a, a honking, and maybe when I was younger it was a middle finger. And then I started listening to this Buddhist podcast, and it's like, bless everybody. So I was like, okay, I hope maybe they're just going to the hospital to pick up their kid. You know, that's my, that's my new line. But, you know, some people, when they have a road rage incident, it does not end well. There are car accidents. 
Um, and when I lived in Chicago, handguns were illegal, so you didn't see them that uh, often or hear about them. So people just had crowbars under their seat. That was like the that was the word on the street: is don't piss somebody off. They got a crowbar under their seat. Then I lived in Phoenix, Arizona, and everyone has a gun, even children. I'm joking. They don't. But, well, they do, but that's because their parents don't lock them up. And basically, in Phoenix, uh, this is terrible. But like I, I used to say to people, don't have a road rage incident. Don't flip anybody off in Phoenix. They have a gun under their seat, and that's true. And I'm not, I'm kind of making a joke, but literally now to go to dramatic, last uh, month in April, some guy cut somebody off in a truck in downtown Phoenix near this cafe I used to hang out at, and the dude shot at the guy's car and killed his daughter right there in central Phoenix where I used to live. So what is the difference between people who are just thinking about violence and those that take action? I think we can talk about risk factors, but we also got to talk about protective factors. So a lot of people, like myself, I have protective factors. You know, I'm married, I have a puppy at home. I don't want to be like in jail for a road rage incident, even if the guy deserves it. Um, so I, th I think about that and I process that. But other people may not have that. They may have experienced significant loss. So I'm going to go into the um, kind of crisscrossing between the stigma of suicide that used to exist and the risk factors for suicide that are well documented and make a case for the fact that I believe the risk factors for suicide are very similar to the risk factors for violence. So these are risk factors from suicide that are well documented in the literature. Um, alcohol, substance use, abuse, isolation, I could read them all, but you, if, if you're in the psych field of psychology, you know risk factors for suicide. There's a lot of them. And then we have protective factors. Do they have somebody they live for? Do they have kids? Whatever. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, I think, and I've seen this in my practice anecdotally, I could not find much research on this, is that when somebody reaches a critical point of stress in their life, and they also are maybe experiencing depression or anger or something else going on, there's a, there, most people, based on their personality, are going to go towards, my life sucks, I should just end it. It'll be easier that way. But there's definitely a fair amount of people who, when they reach that point, that burnout point or that emotional burnout point, they think... I'm going to kill somebody. Th these people have screwed me over. I've lost my job. Um, you know, they repossessed my car. I was bullied. Uh, these people deserve it. I'm not going down. I'm not going to kill myself. I'm going to kill someone else. I'm going to hurt somebody else. They deserve it. So that's my theory. I think a high number of people talk, uh, contemplate it, but do not talk about it. There's a uh, stigma against violence, shame, fear of consequences, judgment. I mean, in your practice, I've, I don't know, but I've had patients tell me, you know, I've thought about suicide. Are you going to call on me? And they don't even know the law that, you know, this is a thought, not a plan. So just imagine, uh, I had a therapist friend in Seattle that told me that one day they had a, a patient who was crying, uh, like a, a male patient crying on their couch, and she'd never seen him that way. And she said, what's wrong? He said, I've been having fantasies of killing my boss, and I don't know how to stop. And and. She said before that session, she had no indicators that this person would ever be violent or suicidal. So people are hiding this stuff. Um, and I would, I would also say this. Committing a violent act is a form of suicide. You, you, it could be. I mean, if it's lethal, people have heard the term suicide by cop. They, somebody's angry. They're, they're doing something, and then they shoot at the police. What are the police going to do? They're going to shoot you back. So you just killed yourself. Um, if, you go, if you go kill somebody else, you basically are asking for a life sentence. That's throwing away your life. So I think suicide, thanks to the work of counselors, educators, people that were um, basically going to Congress and saying this is a national issue, people receive empathy for that now. So if you say, I'm really feeling like my life should end, people are going to give you empathy. If you say, I'm really thinking like all these people's lives should end in my school, they're like, oh shit, call the cops. What are we going to do? People don't react well to that. Even counselors, I mean, that can throw us off. Like, what do I do? Tear us off case? You know, like, what's going on? This is making me a little bit worried. So I think the stigma of suicide, it, it used to be a big thing. It, I, mean, it's, I mean, it's not as big anymore. People still don't report it, but it's an obstacle to reporting how you're feeling. Uh, it prevents research, and we'll get to that about why there's not much, there's some, a lack of government violence research. And again, I said that Congress did not declare suicide a national problem until 1998. That's not that long ago. I, I, was in, I was almost graduating high school at that point, but that's not very long at all. So I believe stigma of violence is creating, is, uh, creating a lack of resources. 
uh, violence, violent thoughts. So why am I spearheading this national thing? I think because we need congressional support. We need anyone to support us on the local level or the national level to start talking about this. And I think that violence should be treated as a national epidemic. Um, because of everything I've said earlier. As you've seen recently, Congress has made special provisions recently in the opiate abuse epidemic problem. And I've even, I've already seen the effects of that in my practice with people having to take less opiates and getting off opiates. So if, we, if Congress does something about it or local politicians speak up, we'll be able to start moving on this. So I guess this is a question for the crowd. Are violent thoughts normal? Or thoughts of violence? Okay. I see some nodding. I would say yes. So if somebody becomes angry, but some, I mean, obviously some people's personalities, that doesn't come out, but it's a normal thought. We have lots of thoughts a day. We have millions of thoughts. Most of them we throw away. We're standing on a bridge. Oh, that's scary. Oh, that looks cool. Oh, maybe I'd fall. You know, we have all these thoughts going through. What if I push somebody? So when, after every time I hear a violent act on the news, People say that's unhuman, but I would just say if we take a look at history and you go back further, violence is human. It's something people have been doing since people evolved. Um, it's everywhere. So I'm hoping that the National Violence Prevention Hotline could be a lifesaver for people that are moving past thoughts and fantasies toward action. We're going to talk a little bit about the cycle of violence because when violence happens, I mean, people have heard about copycat crimes. It, it has an impact emotionally and culturally. There's a ripple effect. So Martin Luther King Jr. said, hate begets hate, violent begets violence. Toughne toughness begets a greater toughness. And we must meet the power, m meet the forces of hate with the power of love. So I believe that Antoinette Tuff in that video that you watched at the beginning was meeting the forces of hate with the power of love. Uh, I've got a story I'm going to play for you at the end that you'll see a similar interesting story there. But this hotline is going to try to meet the forces of hate, anger, misdirected emotion with the power of love and humanizing people. So now talking about violence, the, the government, federal government does not track school shootings. They don't see it as a problem. If you probably other people have said this at this seminar already today, but the Washington Post tracks school shootings, so that's cool. Um, I should subscribe to them. Uh, since the Columbine school shooting in 1999, we've had 228,000 children, this is last week's statistic, in 234 schools exposed to gun violence. That's 11.7 school shootings a year um, and approximately one per month for the last 20 years. But in 2019, we are ahead of schedule. We have had 15 so far this year, which is terrible. So basically, I've said this before, but this would be able to reach anybody who is in crisis, who needs counseling, who needs help, who needs de-escalation and connection. Uh, I do think we have to break the stigma of violent thoughts that we can talk about it like adults. And I do think we have to talk about the cycle of violence. And I believe that a national violence prevention hotline would be a great way to spearhead the conversation in the United States. So this is, this is what it's designed for. Um, anyone considering active violence, anyone who copes by hating others, I, there's probably more than this. People that uh, are engaged in bullying, high, people with high risk that don't, aren't engaged in healthcare services or are, anyone with a history of violence, um, anyone who wants help for violent fantasies, people contemplating revenge, people posting hateful messages, anybody seeking support, they've had violent behaviors in the past, they don't know how to stop, I, that reminds me of the National Domestic Violence Hotline callers that called and said, I need help, I don't know how to stop. Um, people in the legal system for violence acts, people in hate groups, gang members, I would say even people contemplating sexual abuse, I see that as a form of violence. Um, people that are fixated on intimidation, so that's just psychological, but I think that they could also use help. And of course, victims of violence, another hotline for anyone who has been a victim to figure out what can they do in their situation? How do they get out of it? Um, this might be a little controversial, but this is what I see, and this is what I believe. I believe there's stages of planning violence, so pre-contemplation, something happens to me, I'm upset, I don't know what to do about it, 
Maybe I'm not talking it out with my friends. Maybe I'm just holding it in. I don't know, whatever. Something is happening in me, something bad, grief. Um, the Parkland, Florida situation, that guy had lost um, his mom and his dad. And I think somebody else's grandmother had just died before he went and did that shooting. Uh, then we were contemplating, well, I don't want to kill myself, but I'm angry. I need to take out my, I need to take out my emotions somewhere. Then I'm going to prepare for violence. I'm going to find out how to kill people. I'm going to find out how to injure somebody. I'm going to, I'm going to train for it. Then obviously action that results in violence or death. This hotline is obviously only for the th first three stages. If somebody's already in the action, they're probably not going to call on the way to hurt somebody. Probably not. Or in the middle of an act. But in the first three, when people are thinking about it, they're mulling it over, there would be something there for them to reach out in, in a semi-anonymous manner. Obviously, if you recognize that, that's inspired by the stages of change model. So the limitations are clear, like a crime of passion. People are at a party or the people are breaking up, having a fight, and then all of a sudden somebody hits somebody or somebody hurts somebody in a lethal way. That might not, the, the hotline may not be effective because they're escalated. Violence in the moment, so due to escalation, intoxication. So if anyone, has everyone been to a baseball game like the Sox or the Cubs? So I went to a Cubs game uh, last year and they were playing the Cardinals, who's like one of their arch enemies besides the White Sox. And uh, <clears throat> what happened was there was a really bad call, I think. I don't know if it was bad for us or bad for them. Not really sure. But anyway, a few rows away, a bunch of dudes definitely disagreed on this. And they, they disagreed a lot, loudly. And then they disagreed with their beer on each other. And then they disagreed with their fists on each other. And then the police came and arrested, oh, I, how many people? 10? I think it was like 10 people I saw getting hauled off by the Chicago police. It was kind of funny, kind of scary, kind of weird. Clearly, they're not going to be calling the hotline from the Cubs when they're drunk. Uh, and people with antisocial personality patterns may not be reaching out, obviously. Uh, but I do think that there is a big network of people that could reach. Let's talk about de-escalation. I got a cool media clip coming up, but let's just get into this last part here. De-escalation techniques can be taught and they work. Um, obviously, the people manning the hotline would have to know those. Here's an example. Dallas Police Department, 2009. People have heard about police brutality. 147 excessive force complaints, 74,000 arrests. The Dallas population is not decreasing. It is increasing, uh, like most major urban areas. But in 2009, the police chief said, hey, we need to teach our officers something different. This is not working. We're getting all these complaints. We're making the news. OK, so in 2012, 53 excessive force complaints. That's down by like two, almost 2 thirds. 61,000 arrests. That's weird. Why do we have 13,000 less arrests? Now, obviously, there's not a single reason. But part of it is when you confront somebody about a violation of driving or an accusation, and you come at them with an authoritarian voice, they might be apt to argue with you, and then you escalate them, then something happens. That's one of my theories. Um, and, but a huge staggering difference between two, 2009 and 2012 with the de-escalation training, which was a basic training, which I'll show you in a second what it was. And weirdly enough, the city's murder rate reached its lowest point in 80 years in 2014. That might be coincidental, but I don't know. How did the Dallas police do this? Very easy. It was like Psych 101. They just brought them in. Let's teach these officers about the human brain. OK, let's teach them about psychology of people. Let's stop the stigma about these criminals and violent people. That's part of the training. These are just people acting a certain way, humanizing people that may be in, uh, in trouble in their community. And they were also taught, this is from one of the trainings I looked up. They were taught to shift a person from alligator brain, this is their police training language, to higher level thinking. Look how they did it. Oh, that's right. Listen to the person. OK, acknowledge what they're saying. Uh, has anyone ever witnessed somebody getting arrested? Yeah, OK. I've witnessed a few arrests. And I remember one of the arrests, the guy was yelling, I don't even know what he was yelling. And the cop was just going, shut up, shut up, and was putting his foot on his back. And the guy was resisting. And he was like, Bleh. I didn't know what he was saying. But it clearly, he was in pain and couldn't say anything. And the cop kept yelling, shut up. And the guy got more angry. So 
he wasn't listening. Acknowledging what they're saying. Agreeing with the person. Yeah, I understand that you're having a, a, duff, a tough day, or I understand you don't believe you were speeding. Um, apologize. Provide empathy for their situation. Clarifying what the person wants. Asking about choices and consequences. Well, if, if you continue to resist, I will have to arrest you, but if you calmly comply, I might not. We can just have a ticket situation. Asking sequence questions, we'll get into that. Suggestibility, don't you have somebody at home or don't you have a job or, or, or a child that you may want to think about before you take further action? These are basic counseling questions mixed in with a little bit of de-escalation stuff that these police were taught and they had staggering impact. So obviously the counselors who, man, uh, who are behind the hotline, the National Violence Prevention Hotline, would work to de-escalate callers using, using similar techniques. And hopefully, I mean, obviously in some situations, if somebody's calling in and they're about to commit imminent violence, there will probably have to be police involvement. Um, I think this is probably where we're gonna need some lawyers to figure this out. Hopefully, the, p the police that respond have had a de-escalation training. That would be good. So ultimately, we wanna link people to social and public health services and important mental health treatment who may be prone towards violence. So this was an interesting, oh, there it is, okay. A recent ecological study, which is a really awesome study if you want to read about it, it's it, my number one reference, um, was found that increased state level spending on social and public health services was associated with a 16% decrease in the average homicide rate in that state. To me, that's wild. So basically, what that meant was they're spending $10,000 more, the state's spending, for people living in poverty. This was a, p for people on Medicaid, basically. Um, if they spent more money in their community on public and social health services, the murder rate went down in the state. And they did this on every state that was publicly available data, which was, I believe, somewhere in the early, uh, lower 40 states. Um, I found that incredible. So higher spending on people that need health care and giving access to health care makes a difference. It makes an impact in the community. It increases the availability of health care, increases the visibility, probably a lot of other things. Uh, so obviously the study can't totally, they said they couldn't commit to like the causality of this, but they said obviously spending more on health care for people that need it and providing it does have promising avenues for homicide research in the United States. So there's, I, I would say let's create this hotline and collaborate with local and community programs as well as other programs nationwide to increase people's availability to prevention and mental health treatment. So my theory was in this is that engagement and treatment can decrease, doesn't always, but can decrease the chance of a person committing suicide or hurting others versus person not in treatment. I'm pretty sure that will stand up in a double blind. Um, basically, the hotline would be able to help people in treatment or out of treatment. And obviously increased spending would be needed because it's a national program. I think if enough people learn about the hotline, people will start to call and utilize it. Has anyone heard about the New Zealand mosque shooter situation? So this is an individual who probably has some antisocial personality traits, but at some point, years ago, I'm, I'm assuming he was a regular guy at some point, maybe 10 years ago, but he was on social media, hateful uh, forums, he uh, was communicating all the time on these kind of underground websites, and he eventually went into a mosque and live streamed himself on the internet shooting people. So what I'm saying is like, obviously, like that was a pretty bad case, but like what if this person had had an, a, 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 an opportunity to get engage in treatment 10, 20 years earlier? Could something have been different? Or if there was a hotline or a chat room on the internet that he, he could have looked at while, um, planning this, might he, thought, might he have thought something differently? I don't know, but that's just an idea I had. So here's the role of it, the hotline. First of all, we want to help de-escalate the caller. We want to try to humanize the caller. That's a big one, because if you go, why the hell would you want to shoot people? Are you crazy? Well, that's just going to probably make them mad. Motivational interviewing, right? We want to normalize angry or violent thoughts. It's normal to feel like you want to hurt somebody or be angry because this bad thing happened to you. Most, uh, most of the people who are committing these acts either believe something bad, either something really bad did happen to them or they believe something bad happened to them. We want to build rapport with the caller. We want to try to create hope for a different solution than acting out violently. 
and we want to engage, help them get engagement in future treatment or health services to decrease this. So again, linking people to public social health services, which showed the decrease in homicide rates. And also, just like the National Suicide Prevention Hotline, maybe one of you have even called it for a client to find out what you could do. If somebody was um, thinking about becoming violent, instead of going right to the police, you might be able to use this as a resource to find out, should we go to the police or should we go to the hospital? How would it operate? And we're almost to the cool media clip, but how would it operate? Very similar to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. That's kind of how I structured it. Specially trained counselors with empathy, working to build a connection, just like Antoinette Tuff, who could have been killed and so could all those kids. Immediately, instead of, I think, I don't know exactly her story, but she, there's a lot more clips on her on the internet, but she basically just looked right at the guy in his face and was pleading with him, like, you don't have to do this. Your life has meaning, basically, is what she's saying to him in uh, some of the interviews, instead of her going, oh my God, Aunt, you know, get away, she went at him with, with uh, empathy. So that's what our call operators would be able to do with people calling. I think there's already a huge structure in place. We have two very successful hotlines in the United States that deal with domestic violence and suicide. We want to have traditional call centers. All of those call centers are linked regionally with hospitals police departments, crisis centers, et cetera, if you didn't know that, they all have regions that they cover. Each call center has a different region. So um, for instance, a lot of East Coast call centers will be dealing with stuff on the West Coast because they can be up all night and vice versa. Um, we want to create a network of prevention and social programs underneath that and have 24 seven access. A big thing that I've been thinking about is the world is changing. Not everybody uses the telephone for calling anymore. So we want to get in on that, and I think it would be good to provide internet chat for people that are feeling like they want to be violent, as well as texting. Something I thought of also was that we could collaborate with YouTube or Google. So if you know this, you can actually buy sponsored advertisements based on searches. So if we had a budget for this, if someone's searching, how do I kill people, or where do I get an AK-47, uh, a national violence prevention hotline or some sort of advertisement could come up that we paid for that says, are you thinking of you know, hurting somebody? There's another way. Um, I know that sounds a little bit out there, but I think that's where the world's going. People are on the internet. That's probably where most of the people found, to, I mean, like the guy in the New, New Zealand mosque shooter, that's how he found all his materials was the internet. I also think collaboration with social media would be key. Facebook and Instagram have this new fe feature where if somebody's harassing you, you can say something's wrong and report it. So what do they do? They came up with this great idea. We just ban their email account. Isn't that great? What happens? Five minutes later, they create a new email address and they're back on the internet harassing whoever it was they were harassing before. So I thought, why don't we collaborate with them since they have so much power and see about if they are banning somebody, send them educational materials about if it was a violent threat. Here are some educational materials on violence instead of just banning them and then they create new accounts. Obviously, uh, we'd need strong clinical training because not every counselor is gonna be cut out for this position. Uh, we've got to understand anger, power dynamics, uh, motivations of violence, and actually be able to have a high degree of empathy for people that could kill people. That's really difficult. I think that would require a lot of special training. Um, dealing with people in crisis, that's a whole other level of skills. De-escalation training is very difficult. And then how do you triage with local, uh, how do you triage with local emergency rooms or other places like that? And then, if we could, you know, had a successful conversation using motivational interviewing to try to get the person to make an appointment with a local place. So let's talk about the future of the National Violence Prevention Hotline. Where are we going from here? Well, right now uh, I'm trying to get a grant written. I found a grant writer in San Francisco who said she would do it pro bono, but that's about all I've got. It's a one man show. So I'm going to have business cards after I play the last cool clip. It's a really cool story. I think you'll enjoy it. I'll have business cards up here if you want to collaborate or you know anybody that's interested. I want to establish a nonprofit and start trying to get some sort of momentum rolling with some sort of local policymaker where we can, somebody who's got a, a platform. Then obviously if we can establish it, we'll set up the call centers, internet call centers, and then eventually I think it would be more than just a hotline. It would engage with um, local places on the ground to, to create better prevention programs 
and the warning signs of somebody who might be violent and try to uh, teach our counselors and social and public health centers what that is and providing programming for that, just like we have done for suicide and bullying. Um, also, hopefully, even make, making low-cost violent prevention trainings in communities that are underserved. Uh, there's plenty of underserved communities where there's uh, potential people that could become violent, and we need to find them. And then, of course, promoting a public dialogue and an attitude uh, and awareness shift in our culture to actually talk about violence in a mature way. So this is a little story I'm going to play. It's kind of... Um, a meditative sort of story. So actually, uh, you've been learning all day and I just talked at you for 40 minutes. So I would encourage you to kind of close your eyes and listen to it. It's a story that basically um, is another inspiring story and it's not, not triggering. Oh, what happened? Oh, whoops. I'm sorry. Here it goes. And this is a story by a friend of mine who has um, died some years ago named Terry Dobson, who was a very um, accomplished martial artist who trained in many different disciplines in Japan. Um, and I work with him in the men's movement with Robert Bly and Michael Mead and Luis Rodriguez and so forth. Um, he was a great big bear of a man who uh, was also a, a, became a really wise and remarkable teacher. Um, so this is his story. The train clanked and rattled through the suburbs of Tokyo on a drowsy spring afternoon. How many people know this story? Just a handful. Okay, cool. Our car was comparatively empty. A few housewives with their kids in tow, some old folks going shopping. I gazed absently at the drab houses and dusty hedgerows. At one station, the door opened, and suddenly the afternoon quiet was shattered by a man bellowing violent, incomprehensible curses. The man staggered into our car. He wore laborer's clothing, and he was big, drunk, and dirty. Screaming, he swung at a woman holding a baby who was in his way. The blow sent her spinning into the laps of an elderly couple. It was a miracle the baby was unhurt. Terrified, the couple jumped up and scrambled toward the end of the car. The laborer aimed a kick at the retreating back of the old woman, but missed as she scuttled to safety. This so enraged the drunk, he grabbed the metal pole in the center of the car and tried to wrench it out of his stanchion. I could see his hands were bleeding. The passengers were frozen with fear, and I stood up. I was young then, some 20 years ago, and in pretty good shape. I'd been putting in a solid eight hours of Aikido training nearly every day for the past three years. I liked to throw and grapple. I thought I was tough. Trouble was, my martial skill was untested in actual combat. <laughs> As students of Aikido, we were not allowed to fight. Aikido, my teacher said, is the art of reconciliation. Whoever has the mind to fight has broken his connection with the universe and is already defeated. I listened to his words. I tried hard. I even went so far as to cross the street to avoid the pinball punks who lounged around the train stations. My forbearance exalted me. I felt both tough and holy. In my heart, however, I wanted an absolutely legitimate opportunity whereby I might save the innocent by destroying the guilty. <laughs> This is it, I said to myself. People are in danger. If I don't, don't do something, they will get hurt. Seeing me stand up, the drunk recognized a chance to focus his rage. Ah, he roared, a foreigner. You need a lesson in Japanese manners. I held on lightly the commuter strap overhead and gave him a slow look of disgust and dismissal. I planned to take this turkey apart, but he had to make the first move. I wanted him mad, so I pursed my lips and blew him an insolent kiss. <laughs> All right, he hollered, you're going to get a lesson. He gathered himself to rush at me. A split second before he could move, someone shouted, hey, hey, it was ear splitting. I remember the strange, joyous, lilting quality of it, as though you and a friend had been searching diligently for something, and he suddenly stumbled upon it, hey. I wheeled to my left. The drunk spun to his right. We both stared down at a little old Japanese man. He must have been well into his 70s, this tiny gentleman sitting there immaculate in his kimono. 
He took no notice of me, but beamed delightedly at the laborer as though he had the most important, most welcome secret to share. Come here, the old man said in an easy vernacular, beckoning to the drunk. Come here, talk with me, he waved his hand lightly. The big man followed as if on a string. He planted his feet belligerently in front of the old gentleman and roared above the clacking wheels, why the hell should I talk to you? The drunk now had his back to me. If his elbow moved a millimeter, I'd drop him in his socks. <laughs> the old man continued to beam at the laborer. What you been drinking, he asked, his eyes sparkling with interest. I've been drinking sake, the laborer bellowed, and it's none of your business. Flecks of spittle spattered the old man. Oh, that's wonderful, the old man said. Absolutely wonderful. You see, I love sake, too. Every night, me and my wife, she's 76, you know, we warm up a little bottle of sake and take it out in the garden, and we sit on an old wooden bench, and we watch the sun go down, and we look to see how our persimmon tree is doing. My great-grandfather planted that tree, and we worry about whether it will recover from the ice storms we had last winter. Our tree has done better than I expected, though, especially when you consider the poor quality of the soil. It's gratifying to watch when we take our sake and go out to enjoy the evening, even when it rains. And he looked up at the laborer, eyes twinkling. As he struggled to follow the old man's conversation, the drunk's face began to soften. His fist slowly unclenched. Yeah, he said, I, I love persimmons, too, his voice trailed off. <laughs> Yes, said the old man, smiling, and I'm sure you have a wonderful wife. No, replied the laborer, my wife died. And very gently, sweeping with the motion of the train, the big man began to sob. I don't got no wife. I don't got no home. I don't got no job. I'm so ashamed of myself. And tears rolled down his cheeks. A spasm of despair ripped through his body. Now it was my turn. Standing there in my well-scrubbed youthful innocence, my make-this-world-safe-for-democracy righteousness, I suddenly felt dirtier than he was. And then the train arrived at my stop. As the door opened, I heard the old man clunks, cluck sympathetically. My, my, he said, that's such a difficult predicament. Sit down here. Tell me about it. And I turned my head for one last look. And the laborer was sprawled on the seat, his head in the old man's lap. And the old man was softly stroking the filthy, matted hair. And as the train pulled away, I sat down on a bench. What I had wanted to do with muscle had been accomplished with kind words. I had just seen Aikido tried in combat. And the essence of it was love. I would have to practice the art a long time with an entirely different spirit. It would be years before I could speak about the resolution of conflict. So that was a story that I wanted to play at the end that basically kind of encapsulates the whole mission of this hotline idea as well as Antoinette's story. You can look up her if you want to know more about her at the beginning. So the, there's no hotline. We're hoping to have one. I don't have enough hours and I can't stay up all night to answer the phone. So if you want to get information, uh, you can come ask me questions afterwards. Um, there are, I have like business cards that just have the website I made. And on the website, you can just send me an email. Just trying to raise awareness and I'm glad for the Chicago School to let me talk about all of the other statistics and things that I needed to put in there for continuing education. And I appreciate everybody for listening. And my name is Paul Krauss. If you like podcasts, like she said, I do have a podcast called The Intentional Clinician Podcast, or you can just look up Paul Krauss on your podcast app, and you can find me that way. You can send me emails that way. My phone number is on there, too. So um, thanks so much for coming. And if you are interested in the references, I don't know if they're providing these PDFs, but there are 18 references, so you can read more if you're interested in anything I talked about. It's all there. Um, so thanks so much for coming, and we're just at one hour. So. Appreciate your time and I hope you have a great rest of your day.